This is Jack Stanley, and this is number 12 in our talk on the American presidency. And there's going to be a lot of these, I can see, because I started with the idea of talking a little bit, then I found out that I can't talk a little bit. I, I need to say a lot. And uh, so I try to share little tidbits and bits of information about the presidency. Certainly not everything about the presidents, just little aspects of them. And one of the things I hope by doing this, it may spur you on to study different aspects of the American presidency. It's a fascinating group of individuals, if you think about it. You know, when I used to teach about the American presidency, I used to call the class the good, the bad, and the drunk, because alcohol did play quite a bit part of the uh, American presidency. Now, we're going to talk about Andrew Johnson, and Andrew Johnson was our 17th president. He's a fascinating character. He learned to read and write later in life. He was basically born and lived illiterate early on. He was a tailor. His wife taught him a lot of stuff. He would become uh, a politician. He was a great stump speaker in the Tennessee style. And uh, he would give great talks. He was a true constitutionalist. He didn't believe in changing the Constitution at all. He had a saying, and I'm paraphrasing this, the Constitution as it was and forever will be. Something to that line he would say when he would talk about the Constitution. And what he meant by that basically was we're going to keep it the way it is. Because our founders did it, we have no reason to change it. So he was a Southern Democrat, and when the Civil War took place and the mass exodus of states left the Union, Andrew Jackson stayed steadfast with the Union, with the North, and he became the poster child of a good Southern Democrat. And he became the more or less the military governor of uh, Tennessee during the Civil War. Now, Lincoln, when he ran for president in 1860, his vice president was Hamlin. And uh, when Lincoln was going to run again on the Union Party, which was called, got to understand at this point, Abraham Lincoln was a dictator, so it didn't really matter. Um... He ran on the Union Party, and they thought it would be a good idea to have Andrew Johnson as a running mate. Not because Lincoln and Johnson agreed on many things, but because he was a Southern Democrat, he stayed with the Union, and it was good play. And they got rid of Hamlin, sent him off on his way. And Johnson became the candidate for vice president. Lincoln really didn't know Johnson. Johnson really didn't know Lincoln. And they kind of left it that way. They only met a few times, and it was not very often, not very long. On March the 4th, 1865, they had the inauguration of Lincoln. Andrew Johnson was sick. He had a touch of the bug. He might say maybe the flu or something like that. Someone suggested to him, maybe if you have a nice, good drink of some whiskey or brandy, it'll help you. He did that and got hopelessly drunk. When the time came for Andrew Johnson to give his inauguration speech, it became a drunken ranting tirade. People remarked on how Abraham Lincoln was trying to find a way to hide his six-foot-four frame underneath the chair he was sitting on. It was embarrassing. In fact, the person that was most embarrassed was Johnson because he was kind of out of control. Nonetheless, he became vice president under a very rocky start. Now, of course, everyone knows Lincoln was assassinated. He was shot in Ford's Theater April 14, 1865. 
and Andrew Johnson actually was one of the people listed to be assassinated as well, but his assassin chickened out. Secretary of State Seward was viciously attacked and nearly killed. The only one who was successful was John Wilkes Booth in killing Lincoln. I will add one last thing that in many respects historically, and people may find this rather cold, but one of Lincoln's best friends historically is John Wilkes Booth. He creates the Lincoln myth. The, the entire thing we know about Lincoln, his assassination. If John Wilkes Booth had not shot Lincoln, there would be a totally different understanding of Lincoln. But nonetheless, something interesting to think of. Andrew Johnson is contacted. He goes to uh, where Lincoln is laying in bed unconscious. He's in shock. He goes back to his hotel. And there he takes the oath of office after Lincoln's death. He is totally unprepared. Lincoln told him nothing. Lincoln really didn't care to even talk to him. He didn't like him. So when Lincoln was dead, Andrew Johnson becomes president at the end of a war, at the end of a terrible campaign where the entire country is a mess. Everything is screwed up. Everything was set up with the idea of Lincoln got to remember once again the united states is formed up here in lincoln's head i mean the total rebirth of america the only problem was he didn't tell johnson anything so johnson who does not have the same kind of skills lincoln does johnson does not have the same kind of intellect he doesn't have the same imagination imagination the same uh, the same creative abilities. Therefore, he's at a great disadvantage. And he's surrounded by what are called the radical Republicans, who are pushing to change everything with the Constitution. Now, as I told you before, with Andrew Johnson, he is a true constitutionalist. He doesn't want to change the Constitution. This is why he stayed with the North. And the, the South secedes, and the war ends, and Andrew Johnson tries to implement a gentle return to the Union for the South. He is totally unprepared for the onslaught of attack that is going to come his way from the radical Republicans. They want blood. They want to hang Jefferson Davis. They want to hang Robert E. Lee. Andrew Johnson tries to get some control. It's, it's an absolute circus at this point. It, it, it's a free-for-all. In fact, April of 1865 is the year in which this country could have collapsed totally and ended. It's amazing how it survived. There are several people that are to be thanked. One is Andrew Johnson, yes. Another is Ulysses S. Grant. Now, Grant, interesting character, we'll talk about him later, but he basically goes to Johnson and says, if you touch Robert E. Lee, I resign. And, of course, they didn't touch Robert E. Lee. They didn't dare. Because, basically, Ulysses S. Grant told him, he said, you know, you need your military. You get rid of him. You do anything to him. I'm gone. So, 
Johnson tries to implement Lincoln's ideas. Congress has nothing of it. Doesn't want anything of it. It would be interesting, once again, this is such an interesting period of time that uh, had Lincoln lived, how would he have survived this wild tempest of a storm called Congress and the Radical Republicans? He would have survived it, but probably would have come out very wounded. It'd be interesting. We'll never know. However, Johnson came in, and Johnson's a fighter. Johnson. Johnson's stubborn. <laughs> he also does not have the strong feelings for the African American, for the blacks, for the slaves. So give them their freedom. But he doesn't look upon them. Just as Lincoln did. Okay, let's stop the bullshit about Lincoln. Lincoln didn't think blacks were equal to whites. Of course not. They call him the great emancipator, but in reality, he was for colonization of getting all the pres all the uh, all the slaves together, giving them freedom, and then get them rid of them and get them out of the country. We don't talk about that, but Andrew Johnson doesn't do that. But Andrew Johnson uh, is not a very strong advocate for uh, black rights. So. The honeymoon with Congress goes on for a short while. They adore him. And then they start to hate him. And then they discover they can't control him. And it gets nastier and uglier. And Johnson, Johnson does not have a good sense for the public. It doesn't have a good sense for dealing with people. He's a great stump speecher in Tennessee, but that doesn't work in Washington. And he travels the country with General Grant and others at times, makes a damn fool of himself. Things get worse. He is against a lot of the things the radical Republicans do. He's very much against the Secretary of War Stanton, and their relationship gets uglier and uglier, and finally it obviously appears that Johnson's going to get rid of Stanton. The radical Republicans adore Stanton, as they adore Grant. They're all in that league. And Congress goes above the president's head and creates what is called the Tenure of Office Act. Now, what is the Tenure of Office Act? It is basically a law <laughs> that is doing its best to take away all the powers of the executive. And what that law basically says, to put it in its simplest terms, is that a member of the president's cabinet cannot be removed by the president without congressional approval. That's insane. It's totally unconstitutional and totally rips into the power of the executive. Johnson knows that. Johnson says, screw you, and fires Stanton. Stanton refuses to surrender his post, locks himself into his office. Meanwhile, Congress says that you have usurped your powers. And they bring up articles of impeachment against the president. Well, it gets ugly. It gets nasty. And I, I have the books here on the impeachment trial, and it's somewhat of a charade, some, somewhat of a joke. But it gets really ugly. And his character is kind of dragged through the mud. His intellect is dragged through the mud. His idealism is dragged through the mud. This goes on. And finally, he is impeached by the Senate. Uh, 
the House of Representatives. I mean, and it has to go to a vote. And he survives by one vote. One vote saves Andrew Johnson. This whole battle that goes on in the House of Representatives and the Senate over this whole thing over their impeachment. It's ugly. It's nasty. And the person that actually eventually... Well, it's a long story. I won't go into it too much. But the fact is that uh, the individual who voted... Uh, not to impeach, who saves Johnson, saves votes in his way to have had nothing to do with Johnson. Had, had a lot of other things going on. I should do a talk on that sometime. But nonetheless, Johnson survives. And the office of president survives. Now think about this. Now I've told you before, with Lincoln, he totally stretched the Constitution. He changed the office of president. He made it extremely powerful. And what Congress was trying to do was take away those powers from Johnson. They almost did it. Had they done it, the office of president would not would be more or less a joke. It would be ceremonial. And Congress would call the shots. Johnson survives. Stanton leaves. Everyone goes out of their way to let them know how much they dislike Johnson. And that's a very interesting period in our history. I'm going to add more to the Johnson story shortly, um, but I wanted to at least set this up in part 12 here in our talk about the American presidency. About an individual who wouldn't give up, who was stubborn, and due to the fact that he was stubborn enough, the office of president was preserved and saved. We do owe that to Andrew Johnson. There are many aspects other of Johnson that were not too admirable. But that is a very important part of it.